So I was introduced as talking about uh, variable retention, but I'm actually going to talk about a little bit more than that. So I'm uh, presenting to you a case study from British Columbia, and it's from coastal British Columbia. So it's not about lodgepole pine. It's about big trees. Um, <laughs> There's nothing wrong with lodgepole pine. It just doesn't get the environmental attention, at least not in BC, that the big trees do. And you might think from this slide that I'm talking about a project that has a whole bunch of companies behind it. But no, it's a project about 20 years ago from one company. Mill and Bloedel started it. They were bought by Weyerhaeuser. They are now Western Forest Products. And there's another iteration or two in there that I've missed. Before I get to how research informed the good science informed how forest practices changed, maintained biodiversity. I have to start with some context because science didn't drive policy here. Policy changed and science helped inform how that change happened. Okay, because back in the, this was the mid 1990s, BC government was doing good things. They put 12% aside into parks. Clackwatt Scientific Panel had introduced new forestry practices to Clackwatt Sound on Vancouver Island. But there is still a huge environmental attention to coastal BC. And that attention focused on Macmillan Bloedel because they're a big company. They weren't bad. They were probably in our top four companies in the province. They obeyed all the rules. But they worked in these coastal forests that were big and old. So there was a lot of, and they were international. So they had not just local attention, but international attention on those forests. People stopped logging trucks. They, sat on roads and wouldn't leave. They climbed trees. They were hauled away by police. Macmillan Bodell decided to do something about that. They hired a new CEO, Tom Stevens, and he said, we need to change. I want three things to happen. I want Macmillan Bodell to be the safest company in BC. I want them to be the most respected company in BC. And I want them still to make money. Figure out how we do that. And one of the elements of being the most respected company is he said, we can't clear cut anymore. We have to do something different. And at that time, the science took over. He engaged his staff and people with Fred Bennell's group at UBC to say, how do we change from clear cutting? And two things came out of that. Well, the forest project came out of that. You can see from these squares, it's got a whole bunch of things. But I'm only going to talk about two things today, zoning the landscape and variable retention. And I can't just talk about retention because it comes under the zoning of the landscape. I try not to talk about the zoning too much though. Because basically, the change of forestry was to maintain biodiversity, ultimately to be a respected company, ultimately to gain social license for harvesting, still harvesting on the coast. And to maintain biodiversity, we had two main practices. We wanted to zone the landscape so that you weren't trying to produce trees and biodiversity on every hectare. You realized you couldn't do everything everywhere. And then within those zones, you would retain structures, different amounts in different zones. And hopefully by doing that, you maintain biodiversity, maintain species. So let's first look at the zoning. So this is uh, Vancouver Island. I don't have the BC map there anymore, but it's the very west coast of BC. So this is um, Haida Gwaii, Queen Charlotte Islands, which are up there somewhere. And there's a little bit on the, on the mainland coast, but most of the work is on Vancouver Island. So the company zoned the landscape. They put 10% of their tenure into old growth zones, where the focus is on keeping most of the forest. They could still harvest a third of that area, where they did harvest, they had to keep at least 20% in retention. Another 25% of their tenure went into what was called habitat zones. In the habitat zone, 70% of the area could be harvested. The minimum retention levels were less, 15%. And then 65% of their tenure went into these timber zones, where they didn't worry as much about biodiversity. But still, mostly because of topography, only 80% available for harvest. And in that area that was harvest, in every block, there's going to be a retention, minimally 5 to 10% retention. And those were minimums. And so within each zone, we did variable retention harvesting. 
The idea there was to keep the structures from the pre-harvest stand, keep some of them in that stand, keep either representative structures, what used to be there before, but also focus on important attributes like large old snags, large down wood. That variable retention happened everywhere, but it also happened in experiments. It happened differently in different zones. So in the timber zone, here's examples of some of the retention in the timber zone. Remember the minimums were 5 and 10 percent. The company overshot those minimums on almost all cases in all zones. Here's some examples of retention in the habitat zone and a very high retention in the old growth zone. And they didn't just do re retention, they did some interesting silviculture too with different two pass systems and single stem harvesting. So this landscape is starting to look quite different than clear cutting. Again, the idea is just to leave structure, leave it in patches, leave it in diverse, dispersed trees, leave it in different amounts, leave it in experiments, and leave it everywhere operationally as well. And the reason for doing a lot of different things was that adaptive management was written in to the whole idea at the beginning. So they realized we had science that would help us direct us to some zoning and to leaving structure, but we didn't know how much, right? We didn't know what was good for species. So they wanted to do a variety of things and learn, both from experiments and from passive adaptive management on the operational land base and refine things as they went. And we're going to talk a little bit about the studies and learning. How did they go about learning from what they did with zoning? The first things to us, a lot of the zoning happened um, without a lot of rationale behind it. A lot of the forest land in BC is crown owned, but some of it is private owned. And so there were limits to how far the company was willing to go in terms of what went into an old growth zone versus what went into a, a timber zone. So right away in this adaptive management program, we, we assessed the zones, how much is in different zones, what ecosystem types were actually in areas that wouldn't be harvested. And what were the shape of those areas that wouldn't be harvested? Did we still have forest interior or was it all edge? And what did we find out? This is a coastal Douglas fir, coastal western hemlock and mountain hemlock. I don't expect you to remember all that, but just think of this going from dry to wet and then wet and high. So in this gradient of ecosystems from dry to wet and high, just look at the black dots. That's the percent of unmanaged forest if you look over all the zones that Macmillan Bodell put into place. And you can see in the dry areas, there's not very much that's unmanaged or won't be managed over the long term. And as you got wetter and higher elevation, the amounts in these reserves went up, right? So in our dry forests, the zones and the reserve system wasn't doing a lot to provide unmanaged examples of ecosystems. And furthermore, when you look at the size of the reserves, we found out in these dry areas, this top graph, compared to the wet areas, the bottom graph, um, the black bars are how much area is away from an edge, so how much forest interior you have. So in these dry areas, which didn't have much reserved or unmanaged to begin with, of the stuff that wasn't managed, not much of it is forest interior. And in these wetter areas which had more reserves, of those reserves more of it was forest interior. So a real simple monitoring of zones showed us some issues right away. Right? The dry east side of Vancouver Island was a big problem. Don't have a lot reserved there, don't have examples of ecosystems in unmanaged states, and it's all close to an edge. So we present that back to the company. What could they do about that, right? Well, they could change their zones. They could have changed the location of the old growth zones, but they didn't want to do that. A lot of the, uh, the drier part of Vancouver Island is privately owned, and they can go in there and, and harvest without a lot of, of extra rules, so they, they weren't too keen on putting old growth zones on the southern part of Vancouver Island. But they did do some other things. They did locate some more reserves on that part of Vancouver Island. Um, they certainly upped the stand level retention where the amount of unmanaged forest was less. Okay, so the in-stand retention went up in some of those more sensitive areas. 
And it did help locate where we did some of the stand level monitoring to see if species were really doing okay. Did more of that where the unmanaged forest was less. So it was really good to have this adaptive management linked into the system up front where you're dedicated to measuring and to feeding back to management to adjust. And I think that's all I'll say about zoning. So let's look at these stand level practices. Let's look at variable retention. I'm going to talk about two things, habitat structures and some of the species organism work that plants and animals both that we, we did all that time ago. So variable retention was put in place based on our best guess of what should be retained and that we wanted to look at a range so we could test what was working. And we realized we couldn't test what was effective without first checking what was actually implemented. There's a bit of a disconnect sometimes between what a company says it's going to do and what actually happens on the ground. So, the, so it's really important to do implementation monitoring. Did that retention go in? Was it the right percent? Uh, what shapes was it? Was it did it uh, maintain forest influence over the block? Were there snags maintained? So we did this implementation monitoring. And we found out things like, uh, so the different colors are different years. This is the amount of retention that's been <coughs> kept in the blocks. And this is a proportion of the cut blocks with retention of those different amounts. So you can see there wasn't many blocks up here with super high retention, but there's a lot of blocks in the, in the middle parts. And they created similar graphs for, you know, were the, were the blocks anchored on, on ecological attributes like snags? You know, did they have down wood? They, so the implementation monitoring tracked a lot of attributes. And um, things were pretty good, actually. But we found out when we get to effectiveness monitoring, like what does that mean? Yeah, great, you've got 30% retention, but what is that getting us? Or yeah, great, you saved snags, but when the academic goes out and measures and says, yeah, you got snags, you got seven snags, and the manager says, yeah, is that good? Is that enough? Do we care? Right? So effectiveness monitoring is more, is more than saying what you have. It's, is what you have out there making a difference? And so our effectiveness monitoring tried to figure out, is it making a difference? And to do that kind of monitoring, you need comparisons. At least you have to look at if things are changing over time. Ideally, you compare practices and see if some practices are doing better than others at maintaining things you think are important. In the best world, we have targets. Maybe we know how many snags we need. Sometimes our targets can be benchmarks. And we'll be coming back to some of this stuff. So some of our effectiveness monitoring there focused on experiments. Remember, this is one company, hey? Eh? So they put in a number of different experiments, probably around the same time as your EMAN experiments. One looking at group retention, different levels of retention. Another looking at dispersed retention, different levels of retention. Now they're keeping the level of retention constant at 15%, but putting it in different group sizes. And then some kind of quirkier stuff with retention around riparian areas and some group removal, where most of the forest was left, um, and just trees removed. Each of these was replicated three times. It's such a memory search, <laughs> such a long time ago. Uh, so they had a, a number of experiments out there. And the monitoring went on in these experiments and in the, in the operational blocks. Here's what some of those experiments looked like. So that's a group retention experiment with different levels of retention. Here's a dispersed experiment. Dispersed trees at different levels of retention. And every experiment had a clear cut block and, a, and an uncut block close by. And there's the experiment where the retention level was held at 15 or 20 percent and the group size was changed. And again, those are replicated three different places, each of them. And so as well as uh, measuring the uncut forest in the, ret in the retention experiments, they also measured a whole bunch of uncut forest just operationally through the tenure to get an idea of what happens to structures in uncut forest. Again, this is a dry, warm down here, getting up to the wetter, higher elevations here. And looking at snag density, 
in these different uncut forests. And even in the uncut forest, you find that in the drier types, not as many snags, not as big snags as in the wetter types. And they found similar information for downwood. The drier sites had less, wetter, higher had more. And those benchmarks became important. The, uh, the uncut areas that we measured became important because they told us the variability for each of the attributes that were in our cut blocks. And the measurements in the cut blocks would look, this is hemlock balsam, basal area, with percent retention. But this is looking at the whole block. Okay? So some of the block is harvested, some is left. You kind of expect this straight line re relationship that as you retain more, you have more basal area in your cut block. Not a big surprise, but it's less than in the uncut areas. Same thing for snags. There's this more or less linear relationship. You do get more snags as your retention goes up, but it's quite variable. You can get more snags in lower retention depending on what you target. Downwood on the coast, it doesn't matter what you retain. There's downwood everywhere. There's downwood in the opening. There's downwood in the patch. doesn't matter. And for some things, it mattered whether the retention was dispersed or in a patch. So for example, canopy cover would increase with retention levels, but not so much at the same retention levels if it was dispersed retention. And so we're able to look at the effects of patches versus dispersed. I don't expect to be anybody to actually grab graphs in a presentation like this, but the, the basic things were when the forest company, when, when McMillan Bodell, which quickly became Weyerhaeuser, implemented retention, initially they found the patches that they retained, so not the whole cut block, but the patches they retained, didn't have the same number of large trees as the benchmarks in terms of per hectare. Right? It didn't have the same basal area as the benchmarks. It meant that the foresters were choosing not representative areas of the stand to retain. Right? It was a little less in the basal area. It wasn't guts and feathers, but it was a little less basal area and tree size than they expected. They also found that the patch retention did better than dispersed retention at maintaining a whole bunch of stand structures. So canopy cover, shrub cover, um, basal area, snags, downwood, all did better in patches for the same level of retention than in a dispersed retention. But dispersed retention was best at capturing large trees. So when they did dispersed retention, they, whether they wanted to or not, they, they focused on the large trees. We also looked at edge effects within just on the structures, edge effects for structures, and found that they were pretty minimal, at least in the first five years or so after harvesting that we were able to look at. So how did those findings link back to change management? Well, we identified some weak areas, hey? We saw that the patch retention uh, didn't capture the basal area we wanted or the tree size we wanted. And that was changed right away. The company ecologists went out to the foresters on the ground and said, hey, this is what we found. You're not doing it right. Go change it. And they did. Um, and we shifted based on the, the ecological components we saw in the retention. We shifted from having a, a pretty good mix of dispersed and patches of all different sizes to bigger patches and a little bit less dispersed retention. And you can see in the implementation monitoring over time, and this is again in different colors or different years, that the group size of retention has increased over time. So it's pretty simple feedback to management. So now we're going to get on to what we looked at in terms of species. Because remember, and this is sort of the last section, although it's a long section, Remember, the whole idea of having zones and doing variable retention was to maintain biodiversity. And since we didn't want to get into the whole complexity, Dave, of figuring out even what biodiversity was, we just measured some species as a surrogate for biodiversity. And so we wanted to know, how is all this affecting species? Looking at how the landscape zoning was affecting species was too big for us. We narrowed it down to a couple of questions. How is the variable retention amount, the level of it, affecting species? And are there edge effects affecting species? 
And we measured a lot of them. So here's the, the list of things that got studied, at least to some extent. These are studies done in operational sites. These are studies done in the experimental sites. That's variable retention adaptive management sites. And I'm going to talk a little bit about a bunch of them. So one of the studies is on carabid beetles, and I know you've done a lot of this in Alberta. We hadn't done it much before in BC. Oh, here's another graph to digest. Just for fun, we flipped it around, so clear cuts are over here now, and the old growth is over there, uncut. Different levels of retention. Um, these two colors, for those of you red, green, colorblind, the red one and the green one, are four specialist species, like Sakotas and the Staphylinids. And we find that, this is Isabel Pearson did this work, and in the patch retention, this red line, the forest specialists actually managed to hang into the clear cut, into the blocks that were cut, um, with this different levels of patch retention. But at the same level of dispersed retention, those forest specialists didn't do as well. So kind of interesting. Another way of looking at that is um, in these cluster analyses. The clear cuts were quite different. They clustered separately from the patch retention, which was more similar to old growth. So the beetles in the patch retention were pretty more similar to old growth than they were to clear cuts. But at the same levels of retention in the dispersed areas, the clear cuts were more similar, the beetles in the clear cuts were more similar to those in the, in the light levels of dispersed retention than they were to old growth. So you can see that the patches were more effective at maintaining the forest specialist species of beetles. We did studies on mycorrhizal fungi, and this was Tony Trofimo with the Canadian Forest Service. And they didn't really look at retention levels or shapes, but they looked focused on edge effects for mycorrhizae. And, I, and we've seen it lots of times, lots of different places, and this just confirms it. There's a pretty significant edge effect from the forest into the opening for mycorrhizal fungi. One of the things the forest project wanted to do was maintain forest influence over the block. So it wasn't OK to stick your 20% retention in the corner. It had to be scattered through the block. And part of that was because they wanted social license. Right? It had to not look like a clear cut. But we also wanted information that told us functionally how far away can open areas be from forests and be maintaining the things we think are important, like fungi. We did work on bryophytes, mosses, and vascular plants. Um, a lot of that work was around edge effects. Some of the moss work was interesting, though, because we looked also at recovery time. So we looked at mosses out into the opening. So again, an edge effect here. This was right after harvest, though, like five years after harvest. And then they went to other sites that were more recovered after <coughs> harvest and looked at those same patterns. And still an edge effect, but much more um, abundance of, of moss cover over time, so 25 and 55 years after harvest. So there's a recovery that happens. We got started on some cool uh, research that didn't really go anywhere because the company changed hands one too many times. So we had some students climbing trees and measuring lichens, uh, intending to look at edge effects. Whether that ever got written up, I'm not sure. There was a lot of effort, though, spent on forest birds. Uh, I don't know if any of you know Bill Beasy. I think he was invited to give this talk before me. So he was one of the main drivers of the forest project. Worked for Weyerhaeuser, now teaches at Vancouver Island University. But he's also a carver. So one of these birds isn't real. That's a Bill Beasy bird. <laughs> Anyways, we did lots of work on birds for a, a decade or more. And you know, there's lots of birds like dark-eyed juncos that love to be, clear cuts over here again, love to be down here in the open. Those aren't the species we're very concerned about. We're more interested in these species that are more associated with older forests, uh, like the Pacific wren. I still call it a winter wren, but I'm getting to be an old person in the crowd here. And what we find is that the, quite a, quite a common um, condition actually, where in the uncut areas, there's a high variety, 
of whether you find these birds or not. But there are these general trends of increasing abundance of forest specialists, or at least birds with a preference for older forest, as retention levels increase. And I know in Alberta we're talking down here at 5 and 10 percent. We really found big gains of retention up here at 30 to 40 percent. But you have to remember that our coastal forests, is, they don't get disturbed very often. Like the natural condition of a BC coastal forest is forest for hundreds of years, if not thousands of years. Right? So it's a different dynamic. Um, I wouldn't think you'd need the same levels of retention here to, to have similar effects. So quickly through the next few slides, because they all have this kind of pattern. High variability in the benchmarks, the uncut, and this gradual increase with retention. Some of our more sensitive species were this Pacific Wren, chestnut-backed chickadee, same kind of patterns. Golden crowned kinglet, similar pattern, more variable. And Pacific Slope flycatcher, which really didn't show up at all in the low levels of retention. It took higher levels of retention before that critter started showing up. But you can see how variable they are in the uncut. They're not always there in the uncut forest either. And if you look at where those birds actually were found in the experimental blocks, it's kind of interesting. You can see that the, the retention patches here are a variety of sizes. And your chestnut-backed chickadee is using all of them. The, the red are just where the survey points were. The yellow are the locations of the birds. So even in the little patches, the chestnut-backed chickadee is showing up. Even in the little patches, the varied thrush is showing up. But the brown creeper and the Pacific Slope flycatcher, they're only showing up in the bigger patches. So that's information for us. Here's another way to look at that. The bird work was mostly done by Wayne Campbell and Mike Preston, by the way. Lest you think I did all this stuff. Um, if you look at the community, this is just sort of the top 10 birds. The group retention here was more similar to the uncut forests than it was to the clear cuts. So group retention really did function pretty well to keep some of our more sensitive forest species. Yeah, it's just another graph saying the same thing. <clears throat> so from the bird monitoring, we found out that patches were better than dispersed for birds. Um, that the late serial species, or the ones that are at least more sensitive to late serial conditions, um, the, the VR actually did do good things for them. But they're super variable. Even in uncut forests, they're quite variable. Um, the other bird monitoring that we did was uh, b summer bird survey routes. So we increased the breeding bird survey routes on Vancouver Island by a lot. And that was partly just to get context for what was happening in our forest experiments. So we wanted to know, like, what are the trends happening here in the broader landscape? So on Vancouver Island, they put in a, a whole lot of uh, breeding bird survey routes. In part two, to get routes into the forest. I don't know what it's like here in Alberta. But our breeding bird survey routes like, tend to be between Victorian and Nanaimo on you know, really good roads, not out in Timbuktu going through old growth and riparian zones and that kind of thing. So <clears throat> because this was an adaptive management project, we tried to find species that we wanted to monitor over the long term. And they didn't all pan out that way. We started out studying squirrels, for example. Found out they're in old growth and second growth and young forest and everywhere. So that was the end of that. <laughs> we did studies on slugs and snails and uh, puppy dog tails, but gastropods and salamanders. And this hadn't been done before, and it was a bit of a stretch to get the forest company to want to do that. Uh, like, why would we monitor slugs? Well, they are very sensitive to forest floor conditions. They're really highly sensitive to moisture. Um, and actually, some of them will turn out to be decent indicator species. Um, because it's a new study and people hadn't really looked at them very much anymore, there were some, some cool things that we found. Uh, definitely more slugs and snails in uncut forests and clear cut. Definitely more in groups than in dispersed retention. Um, and we found new species. We found the jumping slug, which can jump half an inch can jump half an inch to avoid predators. Here's another one of our uh, projects that didn't, didn't really go anywhere. 
we were trying to figure out if buffers around ponds were necessary to go around the whole pond or if you could just do part uh, for our amphibians. Um, and this project got started a little later on in the process and then companies changed hands a few times and I don't think that actually went anywhere. Lest you think this was a perfectly organized project. So if we think about the species monitoring, what did we find out? The variable retention as it's undertaken on the coast does show a lot of promise for maintaining species that are associated with uncut forests. The group retention is generally better than dispersed retention for species. But there's a lot of different um, responses and some of the pilot things just you don't expect to, to pan out in the long term. We would have refined our species list had we had the chance. We took that species work and tried to relate it to the habitat work and to the zoning work by creating models that would link our species results to projections of habitats within the zones over the landscape. And uh, a few projects like that happened. But then BC cut a whole bunch of funding. And that's what I want to talk about now, actually. So just to recap, the forest project by Macmillan Bodell got started to gain social license. And to do that, the forest company wanted to be most respected. They wanted to maintain biodiversity to gain that respect. And to do that, they did three things. They zoned the landscape to represent ecosystems in unmanaged state. They maintained habitat structures. And by doing that, they hoped they maintained species. And they checked. They monitored to see if that was happening. They monitored in a whole variety of approaches that I've talked about today. The company managed to have it continue for a long time. Like we worked on this for probably a decade. In spite of when McMillan Model was bought by Weyerhaeuser, it carried on. When Weyerhaeuser changed to Western, things weren't so great. Um, and I guess that's an issue here, is that this was really wonderful while it went on, and now it's not going on. Right? Other things in BC are happening in the central coast. They have zones, they build reserves, they're doing retention. So it's been adopted other places. It's been very useful that way. It's inspired other places to do really good forest management. But the forest management in these areas by this company um, has slipped backwards. And because the environmental communities think everything's looked after, got the Clackwatt Sound panel, did that. Weyerhaeuser did the forest project. Central Great Bear Rainforest all looked after. There's no environmental eyes on the coast of BC anymore. And now, although they used to be going way more than variable retention, like way more than their minimums, now they're far below their minimum. 